Hey, this is Troy Taylor with the Championship Football Coaches uh, Clinic Podcast, sponsored by Rat Coach Sports Workbook, the Top Hopper, and Tip of the Spear. Top Hopper. Use the code Top Hop. You'll save 5%. But we have Mike Pollock of Tip of the Spear here today. And we're so lucky to have met Mike and to have Scott Peters have came on uh, the podcast. Uh, Mike, for the people that don't know you, the people that are watching now live, and the people that are going to watch, tell us a little bit about yourself and where you're from, Mike. Perfect. So um, I grew up in the football capital of the world, uh, Arizona, which is practically nobody's from. It seems like everybody came from some place else. I'm one of the few that grew up here and kind of didn't want to play football. I was a baseball guy mm-hmm. and kind of my based off my size, I had a lot of coaches saying that you should pursue football, pursue football. And um, there's a story there, but I ended up not playing football until my high school, my freshman year of high school, um, but still minded to wanted to, in my mind, wanted to play professional baseball. Um, then by my junior year had starting to have college coaches come out spring ball and kind of realize how athletic I was and started getting some offers and, uh, had a conversation with a baseball scout that basically convinced me that football was going to be my my future. I had a, a longer future there, so I decided to to stay home with Arizona State. I was a center, never snapped a ball in my life before. Spent my first year snapping a Nerf ball because I couldn't get the ball back to the quarterback on time. So um, learned all all about the the camaraderie that goes in the locker room and being the Nerf guy throwing the football around. Um, had, had to chip away and, and kind of earn my role and put in a lot of work and ended up becoming one of the best centers in the nation and was a second round draft pick to the Annapolis Colts, spent seven years in the NFL, four with the Colts, one with the Carolina Panthers, and my last two with the Cincinnati Bengals. Um, played a lot of football, at a lot of high level. And when I got done, I was unfortunately one of those guys who kind of didn't want anything to do with football, just burnout, you know. I think it was like 16, 17 consecutive falls playing football. It does a, a number on not only your body, but your mind. And so when I got done playing, um, I kind of wanted to get away from the game and um, was approached by a mentor of mine um, who was coaching at the high school I went to, who's the head coach, and asked if I'd come and help out with the offensive line a couple days a week, nothing serious, just volunteering my time and thought I could do that and, and wanted to help him. He felt like he helped me a lot. Um, and during that time, I had kind of taken a kid under under my wing who um, was really on no college radar. He was kind of a beanpole and um, h- h- tremendous work ethic, but ended up earning a scholarship to Boise State to play football. And the 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 aspect of having a small s- small momentary interaction with this kid who, through my own information that was passed on to me from other coaches. I was able to, in some part, help put this kid's life path on a different direction that even he didn't think was possible. I thought that was really cool. Um, always had tremendous respect for my coaches. Never really anticipated that was a, a path that I wanted to go down. Um, but the next year I came back as the offensive coordinator and I- enjoyed it. And game planning, I, I, high school football, man, watching some some tape and you see tendencies of defensive coordinators that, that – having knowledge from my NFL experience that I could take down here and be like, look, we're going to eat up this defense. And um, I had a a lot of fun doing that. And then about that time I got reconnected with Scott Peters, who was doing his safe football program. He he, uh, did a clinic for our coaching staff and I was just blown away with not only the information he was teaching, but it was just the epiphany of, why was I never taught this as a player, you know, and obviously scheme has always evolved, but it felt like the teaching, the technical aspects of contact in football seemed to be in a cyclical cycle. Now there's always different camps of um, like lead step, zone steps, stuff like that. But the drills and stuff that I'd seen at every level of football seemed to be very similar. And this was, and what Scott was doing with say football now tip of the spear was very outside of, that norm. And he, and when I was in the NFL, I went into the NFL as he was kind of phasing out into his MMA uh, career, but every off season, he'd give me a call and be like, Hey, Paula, come out and, and train at my gym. I want to take you through some drills. And in my mind, I'm like, I'm a football player. Why? I, I don't have an interest in boxing or MMA. Like, why would I do this 
to how would how would MMA help me as a football player? I didn't really connect those dots. And then I started going around. And when I was with the Bengals, um, Coach McNally, who was on with Scott, um, was a consultant for us. So he was cutting up game tape. And one day in the locker room, I see Scott rolling through. And I'm like, man, there must be something to this. And so when I saw it from the coach's perspective, when I was coaching high school, I said, man, there's something here. So I started shadowing him around. Um, I was kind of moonlighting as his assistant um, instructor, but I was still primarily coaching high school football. And then I got offered a, a position. Our head coach was moving on to the athletic director role and asked me if I wanted to take over as a head coach. And after two years of coaching high school football, one, I didn't feel like I, I had enough experience to truly deserve that role. Um, but I kind of knew what the next 20, 30 years would look like if I chose that. Whereas I, there was something in the back of my mind going, if I, if I did something out of my comfort zone, which is what I did to choose football and it paid off for me. And I'm like, if I follow Scott and go down this path with say football tip of the spear, there's a, there's a path here that can change the game for the better. Mm -hmm. And when I came out of the NFL, it was the, the concussions and the CTE was like on the precipice of every newspaper that was coming out. It seemed like there was this anti-football narrative out there. And I was kind of brainwashed into that, sadly to admit that I didn't really want my kids to play football. And my wife and I were in agreement, like, yeah, our boys are going to do something different than football. She, she was a physical therapist, so she could see the physical toll that it had taken on my body. Um, but I basically did a clinic for her. And I said, what do you think about this program? And it kind of, the science behind of it meshed with her understanding of the body. And she's like, if our boys learn to play football this way, I, I will have no qualm. And I, and I kind of had this light bulb moment where if I could sell my wife to get my, convince my wife to let our boys play football with this instruction, then I have something here. And not only do have we had a lot of success at the youth level, but Scott's now in the NFL performance based program. So a lot of the safety talk, it's like, oh, I don't want football to turn in the soft version of the game. And so we we have a program that I can go to a football coach and like, look, coach, this can make your players, even if they're undersized, better. And you can pull out every drop of potential and maximize it on game day, but I can go to a parent or an administrator who is more concerned about the safety and reducing risk and liability um, with with, the, with a similar message. Like this is, um, like Scott says, safety is the byproduct of superior technique. And so that was really a big deciding factor for my path. It's I, I could have stayed in the high school coaching realm for a long time and been very happy with it. Um, but now I have a, a, a great opportunity to kind of preach this new gospel in a way of this outside the box thinking in terms of football and it's catching on like wildfire. And so it's really cool to see that stepping outside your comfort zone and going, you know what, I don't know, this might fall flat on its face, but the potential there was something that was always scratching at the back of my mind going, there's something here that the game needs but also there's a lot of great coaches out there who we can take even higher by elevating their own understanding because what I've found now years removed from the NFL as a player and more, and putting in years as, as a coach, you kind of realize that scheme is passed down from who you've been around, who you study, but the technique has been that way too. And so it's like a lot of the high school age coaches that we is still probably our biggest demographic uh, of who we work with. A lot of the drills that they prescribe to their players typically are ones that they did as a player or they saw at a clinic and, and maybe just like, I like what that does or I like how it looks, but I don't really know the depth of why it works. And my number one reason I, I preach to the spear is everything we teach has a why behind it. Whereas I felt like a lot of the instruction we had as players, it was like the old dad adage, do it this way because I said so. And that's it. Like, don't, don't talk back to me, just do it this way. And 
what we've found is we live in this world of crazy information. We have access to information. There's everyone's a guru and, and whatnot. But if you have a coach and it can describe why I'm asking you to do it this way, you're giving a level of information to a player that wasn't there previously. Because on game day, when it's the, the ball is snapped, there isn't time to go, oh, what did coach tell me in that one practice or in that one meeting room? He's got the players have to be able to adjust. And 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 the best football coaches are the best at adjusting on the fly. And by giving players a level of information from a technical perspective where they understand why, they're more likely to troubleshoot when the player isn't lined up exactly where it was on the whiteboard or when we did walkthroughs. They're they're able to process and have a better understanding. So it, it, they become really like their own coach out there on the field. And, and that that's helped me to really dive in this fully and every level that we bring this to it's, it's, it, you, you see that light bulb moment where um, like Scott was talking about having like the thumbs out on your podcast last week, when we show that to coaches, like I'll never forget when he, when, he comes back from a combine and he's like, no, you'll never forget. You'll, or you'll never, um, you'll never know like how crazy it is to see guys who you see on Sundays, on Saturdays, just peak of their game that are taking away. It's like they're a novice when they're introduced to this. Like I'll never forget when we went out to the Cowboys training camp a uh, number of years ago and Scott and I are in there in front of guys like Tyron Smith, Zach Martin, Travis Frederick, who are perennial pro bowlers. Uh, a title that Scott and I never achieved as players in the NFL, but they're looking to the information that we're provide, providing. Like we have some PhD in, in contact and they're sitting there just soaking it all in. Um, so it's cool to have a program, to be a part of a program that has information that is evolving the game in a positive manner where it seems that the narrative, is, it, it, football's been in a reactive mode for very long for, for a long time trying to say, no, there's not this concussion pr problem or we, we need better equipment or better medical protocols. We're, we're saying, let's, let's, let's approach this issue, this problem on the front end and be, and create a way to be more proactive. And I mean, I haven't looked back and um, it, it, it's, it's cool. The only thing I do miss is that game planning. I don't get, I go, I go do a clinic for coaches or a camp for some players and I leave and it feels like, you're, you're attached to that program and you, you get that sense of that, what it felt like to be a part of a team after a victory, but like the game planning, the, the schematic um, breakdowns, the, the debating, like, Hey, what, what, what play would go he well here against this formation? How do you think they're going to line up to this personnel group? Um, that stuff I miss. Um, but I get to I get to live that when I'm coaching my my son's football teams now. I get to <laughs> attack those younger kids with with some high level information. Yeah, I mean, when I looked at y'all's website, and you know, my background is a little different probably than most coaches. I mean, I I graduated high school in 1996, but I played football for a guy named Matt Bland that played at West Virginia for Mike Jacobs, who was the line coach. And he went on to be Orlando Pace's offensive line coach at Ohio State. But my coach studied Wang Chung, or however you say it. I mean, we learned Pac style, center line, using our hands. I mean, this was back in 1992, 1993. So, like, I'm really open-minded. But there's some coaches that aren't. But when you go to your website and you see a program like Highland Springs High School in Virginia, has won five state championships in the last seven years, and they believe in this, and they practice it, and they are really, really good on the O-line and D-line. How do I know this? I'm from Richmond. We got beat by them in the regional championship. They went on to win the state championship. So when you see teams like Highland Springs, and they have bought into this philosophy and this program, you know how does that make you feel, and are people aware? that there's a team that's won five state championships. You probably have more. Um, yeah. Yeah. We, the country, we, but, you know, how does that make you feel? I mean, it's awesome. I, I love, I mean, it, it, it's really the best of both worlds. I mean, I have yet to have a single program um, go through our program in, in any capacity and go, you know what, that was a waste of my time, or I already knew that. 
working with Coach Johnson at Highland Springs, man, that that's a, a memory that I'll never forget. I mean, what an amazing program. Um, there's obviously some challenges there, but the 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 men that Coach Johnson brings around him to support him, and they're all on a, a, a singular mission, right? It's 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 team above we, and it's really cool to see that execute in real time. Um, but I mean, coach was originally bringing me out to work with the O-line and D-line. Like that was where we primarily focused on, but the, the foundational level and how our bodies really operate very similar in, in regards to contact, whether I'm on the line of scrimmage or I'm out in space as a skill position player, he really could see the value of it, not just applying to line play. Now, I'm not going to tell you how to <laughs> beat man uh, man press on a release um, or how to cover. <laughs> yeah, not I mean, just I'm like, not, I mean, I'm, how to I'm not that guy. Like being a D lineman, being yeah. a D lineman and getting yeah. to the quarterback. Right, but yeah, most high schools, but most high schools, like, and, and this is where um, a lot of programs come to us that are looking for outside of the box type of information because, I mean, there isn't a tackle on every single play. There is contact, guys engaging and contact in some capacity, whether it's disengaging from a, a potential block, whether it's trying to secure a block on the perimeter. And a, a lot of the information out there for that, those realms are, is very limited. And what we've done with, and what Scott's done with this program is creating a foundational tr like tree. And so we have our, our principles of contact, um, our BLAST acronym that nearly all aspects of contact can be traced down to these principles and if you can apply them to different schemes. Now, there's sometimes when I go work with a, a wing T team, they don't want to know anything about our zone stuff. I'm like, okay, cool. I'm not here to tell you what to do and how to do it. It's, this is how the body works. Let me, let me tell you things that I didn't know playing at the highest level of the game. And this is how you can incorporate it to what you're doing. And I think Scott and I being offensive linemen, and I mean, it's, it comes with the position, like the humility uh, of going, it's not my position. I mean, our, our whole staff is former NFL players. We don't do that to go into a room and wave, hey, we're, we played higher levels of football than you, so listen to us. It's, it, it's really to reinforce we have that opportunity that most guys would kill for but we're saying, hey, if I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't go through that same process. There is a more efficient and more practical and more streamlined progression that we can elevate contact and working, especially at the high school and below, each state has very, very different guidelines and what they can do in the off season, what they can do in regular season. So we wanted to provide information that it doesn't matter if you have spring ball or, I mean, some states don't even have spring ball. Some, sprint, some teams are able to be full pads. Some teams are able to be in shorts and shirts. There's so many different capacities of iterations of spring ball and off-season work where offensive linemen, I, I was doing tug of war, pushing a truck and lifting weights and trying to eat to get my body weight up. Well, that didn't necessarily make me better at my craft. And so we want to provide information that regardless of the equipment that you're able to use, Contact, when you break it down to its lowest common denominator, is just body mechanics that you can replicate. Like, I mean, Scott said he was a baseball guy. I was a baseball guy. So in the offseason for baseball, I'm learning how to stay back and hit a curveball. Learning how to, I'm learning how to craft the skills that I need to be good at the, on game day and the nuances of those positions. Where linemen, I mean, in the offseason, skill guys, you have sevens. And even sevens has turned into – non-realistic football right i'm seeing a lot of running backs on texas routes taking advantage on taking advantage of things that are not really realistic when you go 11 on 11 mm -hmm. but for linemen it's all right we're going to do one-on-one -on -one pass rush in our underwear and oh that was a bull rush no it wasn't a bull rush and so it's still real ticky tack and so we're, we're trying to provide different options that teach and instill the postures, the mechanics, the angles, the things that we want our players to achieve at a high level on game day, but creating a progressive system that no matter what time of time of year it is, if your players are ready to work on their football skills, we have drills, we have information that can help them get to the point where 
not only they want to be where but where coaches want them to be because at the end of the day time is a coach's most precious commodity there's never enough time and in football um being a team sport you spend most of practice in team periods and if if you're running out of time what period always gets cut it's individual period it's like oh you had three five minute individual periods we're going to cut one indie or we're going to cut two indies today because we got to do this one we got to put in this special play that we we we're talking about where we're at the bar individual development is such a low low focus and i get it there's only so much time and you've got a bunch of players you're trying to put through repetitions and so there's a lot of old ways of of playing and teaching this game that that i don't i i, I don't think are necessary anymore um and so we're just trying to find ways to optimize a coach's time and provide information to players that can help them take it upon themselves to expedite their own skill development so you already knew coach mcnally from being with the Bengals. when did you first hear and we've got some questions from um, YouTube yeah. for you already. But when did you first hear that Coach McNally was on Twitter? And did you think it was him? Did you know it was him? And did you have any idea how he got on there? Um, I, I I heard the story of how he got on there. Um, but, I mean, McNally is a, a character, man. He, one of the most respected like, – I, I don't. I've yet to meet a guy who doesn't like Coach McNally. Um, I, I, I have stories up for day. We could be here for days talking about McNally stories. Um, one of my favorites is when he came out, um, when he was a consultant for the Bengals, it was one of our winter practices where they got the heater jets, where if you, if you stand too close, your skin is melting, like, uh, late, yeah. uh from the Indiana Jones movie, yeah. or you're, uh -huh. you stand too far away and it doesn't work. Well, McNally was near one of these um, heaters telling us stories and guys like Andrew Whitworth, uh, Clint Bowling were some of the veteran guys on our team. They're, they're asking him questions, just picking his brain from a football standpoint. Um, and all of a sudden you see this plume of smoke coming up from behind him. And the and he's just in full speech, you know, like when, when, when yeah. Chris McNally is, was going, like he's, he, going, he's, yeah. full, he's fully committed. Yeah. Um, all of a sudden the smoke keeps getting bigger and bigger and the players look down and his pants are on fire and they're like, <laughs> coach, coach, you're, you're, you're on fire. And he just looks down like it's no big deal. And he's like continuing to tell the story as he's like swatting his pants and putting out the <laughs> fire. Like the guy loves football, like, like nothing. Um, uh, I'm sure he's told you the story, uh, the, the tight end, uh, um, where did, I mean, I've only known him for like six weeks, oh, man. Dude. He's told me a lot, so, but I mean, probably so there's not. A, uh, a tight end, Chris Manhurts. Um, I'm trying to. He just signed somewhere. I'm. I'm. I'm blanked. I feel bad. I shouldn't. I shouldn't. I should know this. Anyways, so Chris Manhurts previously was in Jacksonville, Carolina, New Orleans, but he played his first time ever putting on a helmet was in a rookie camp with the Buffalo Bills. He played college basketball at Canisius College in Buffalo, New York. Jim saw him at a grocery store and just was enamored by this the size of this man and asked him if he'd played football and long story short he he got him connected with scott brought him out to here to arizona worked on his blocking ended up and now he's in his going into his eighth year in the nfl never Are played you telling football. me that coach mcnally found this guy in a grocery store that, that that's what i that's i gotta that's talk to this guy yes. i got you gotta yeah. text me chris, his number man i gotta yes. get this guy on chris, I mean, chris what is an amazing story. It, it's an amazing story man it is uh, uh. but but Mc, coach mcnally w w is so humble like he's not gonna self-promote that you know like there there's these the the number of people who have been influenced by coach mcnally is wild but to see him on twitter now um, I, I don't know if he's got the caps lock on, if it's stuck on his computer, but, um, I, I saw somebody sent me a video of him where I don't know if he put the music to it or if it was yeah, him doing we, some, me, me and my we, buddy did, we, he, okay. my, buddy, my buddy coach bald, he put the MC hammer. Yes. Yes. So that's, that's been circulating around some, um, the former NFL, NFL combine. Yes. Yeah, it's the, been going around the NFL combine. People are talking about coach McNally being on Twitter. Yes, yes. It might be the best video that describes Coach McNally if you've never met him in person. Um, but I mean, what what a great, great, great coach, you know, Man. just from 
And, and what's so impressive from my perspective is how willing he is to leave what he's taught in the past to continue going forward to find new ways. And that's what mm -hmm. Scott has always done with Tip of the Spear is we want to find the best method. And we believe what we're teaching now is, but at some point, hopefully we continue to evolve because we'd never want to be stagnant. And to see Coach McNally stress that and always search and always look for more ways to improve, um, I, I think is, is needed more in, in the coaching culture. No doubt. So Wyatt, he, he sent this question before we even got on here. He said, if the defender has longer arms than you, how do you get his hands off and your hands into his chest? Do you have a simple and practical drill that's simple enough for high school? This so he, is a this is a great question. Studying right at the tip of the spear. Absolutely, and you know what? I this was me my entire career because one of my biggest knocks at the combine was I had little baby T Rex arms, and so I was going against defensive linemen who could tie their shoes standing up, and I'm sitting there swatting at a guy. So we have a drill called the refit drill, and it's just a basic hand fighting drill but the mechanics are very detailed and it's really like the last we, we talk about tracing a complete circle with the thumb getting back to that position of strength and it's really that last 25 percent of the circle is where you compromise the shoulder and shoulder plane of your opponent where you re regain control of that guy if you have shorter arms than your opponent you're likely not to re you're not likely not to secure a hand fit on his breastplate but you can still create that lift that low to high motion on the bottom of the tricep just that that does the same job and now once you've elevated that shoulder plane you can continue to close that space and regain control of him so i mean we have um, a bunch of videos and like on our website tosfb.com we have a free 30-day video trial really to prove like hey we're not we're not we're not pedaling so how, how do they get that do they just go to the the website and just sign up and they get yeah 30 yeah, days so, free yeah, yeah. So you go to wow. our website, tosfb.com, you sign up. We have we have two different video libraries. We have our contact drills library, which is our core drills, and then our tip of the spear library, which is very heavy offensive, defensive line, and then a lot of our pro clinics are in there as well. Is this, is this the correct website at the bottom of the screen? Yes, tip of the spear tip, football tip of the football or you can do tosfb tosfb.com. Try to shorten it to make it easier to, yeah. to, to get there. But yeah, you, you sign up um, and it's a free 30 day trial. So watch the videos for a month free. And if you like them, um, our, we add videos every month. Our current subscribers will send us, hey, can you do a video on this topic or on this technique? Or I'm having trouble here. And so we add new content based on what the demand is from our subscribers. If you don't like it, cancel but if you stay on for that 31st day we're going to definitely take that money yeah so um, jim jim Tim's but, but got that, a question. yeah to, to, to finish up so that refit drill yeah is a great drill and then that goes into we have a king of the ring drill i think is a free video on that web yeah, page that. it's so so we have drills that progress into it and so um really emphasizing that low to high mechanic a lot of times kids at the high school level and below they refit their hands and they only complete 75 percent of the circle because in their mind my hand is back inside but it's that last 25 percent that really regains control and changes the, the position of strength from being the opponent in his position of strength elevating the shoulder now creating a weakness allowing me with the shorter arms to get into the frame of the body there's a lot of coat or a lot of techniques that talk about like knocking hands down from a blocker's perspective, I don't want to take my hands off my opponent. So I'm trying to stay connected to him as much as I can. Yeah, and I mean, we've always talked about regrouping, refitting. But the one thing I picked up from y'all is that you do it one hand at a time. So when you're using one hand, like Coach McNally says, one hand, one arm's longer than two. So if you have short arms, you can't do both at the same time. You got to do one at a, uh, at a time. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, and it really stems back to not wanting to take a hand off. We always want to be connected to our opponent. And by drilling one hand at a time, it, it allows me to create that muscle memory where I'm focusing on all aspects. And so a lot of the uh, techniques that we t we talk about have a specific sequence that they need to follow. And so I equate this to 
Um, like when you take your kids to a restaurant, they have the kids menu with the connect the dots. The more dots the player knows, the more likely he's going to be consistent. If the picture is supposed to be a cat and then and there's only four dots, the, it's not going to be a very clear picture. If I have 12 dots for this picture and I go one, two, seven, four, eight, nine, and I go out of sequence, well, then the result is not going to be the one I want. So it, it's a a kind of progression of drills, but the instruction is based on a sequence. And oftentimes high school players, they hear the play in the huddle and they go, oh, I got to block that guy. They, they're already focuses on the result and not the, the sequence, the progression, the process. So we want to put the process first and then the result will take care of itself. Now, Jim Tim, who's from Rochester, New York, uh, he wants to know what is the most challenging aspect of your job over the years? Um, as what I'm doing now with tip of the spear, it's, um, it just the, the number of places that I'm traveling to, you know, like having to go across the country. Um, I, I'm getting ready to go. I think this week I'm going up to Colorado state. Uh, and then next week I'll be in Texas. And so it's, it, the hardest part is being away from home and having yeah. to miss kids events, you know? Um, but what makes it worthwhile is you're developing these relationships with people like everyone that comes to us is they're, they're very similar minded. You know, they, they have good intentions of wanting football to stay an aggressive sport. They want to figure out how to give their kids, their players, the best information possible. So we've developed so many great relationships over the years, but definitely spending a lot of time in airports and yeah, some of the, the challenges that lie in that. Yeah, so not only do you have, you know, some of the best high schools in the country, but you have colleges and you have Scott Peters in the NFL. So, I mean, the proof's in the pudding right there. Now, Jim Tim's asked another question. When you have difficult um, days, all for difficult days, how do you encourage your players to stay focused and motivated? Yeah, so linemen, it can be very difficult for them to kind of approach that process day in and day out because mm -hmm. they're not they're not receiving the same types of rewards on game day that the guys who are scoring the touchdowns they go to school they're getting second picks in in the girls you know they're getting the leftovers most of the time um so creating a game within the game so there are some coaches who who prioritize like pancakes and have things to yeah or finish blocks, you know, um, I, I like to keep them in a competitive mode, you know, like, so when there's a lot of drills like that, that we do on our website that are competitive, that bring that fire and, and kids, players, they love to compete. And the more we can build in competitions that in my, in my eyes, I don't like competitions that don't have correlation to what we're going to do on game day. So I've done my tug of wars. I've done my towel pulls, the tire pulls. There's nothing wrong with those. I just want to spend, you know, every drop on the field working on things that are going to help me kick the guy's butt on game day. Um, so whether it's from the past standpoint, past pro standpoint, run game, doing things that are going to um, keep guys in a competitive atmosphere you know it might be hey who's going to be I, you might have little tiny rewards a reward system who's the first guy out to um practice who's going to be the last one in the locker room to continue to work like putting little incentives that are embedding a work ethic into their their approach because i think a, a coach has done his job i mean you're going to have different players you're going to have the players who you don't have to tell them to work hard and then you have the players who you feel like you're turning gray earlier because you're kicking in the butt every day trying to you see their potential but they don't see it themselves and so uh, to me if you can get a coach that sees his value is a, it's above himself there are some coaches who make it about themselves and like for me like i got to play in the nfl cool but that's not who i am like mm -hmm. I want to, I want the kids who I work with now, the players that I'm working at at different levels, like make it about them. Like, what is like, what drives you? Like, what, what are your goals? Maybe, maybe they've never had somebody talk to them about those. Mate, I know, I, I mean, coaches have such an important role as a mentor because you never know what a kid's 
home life is when he goes home. Does he have the parents who it's like, oh, where were you? Oh, football practice. Oh, yeah, I forgot you did that. Or you have like the overbearing parent who's trying to coach from the stands and and the, the parents who are not in the picture. So you have this whole spectrum that you never know. Um, I mean, and being an offensive lineman, you, you have the biggest position group on the field. So you're likely to have a wider spectrum of players um, physically, mentally, emotionally. So it's a giant challenge to get them fired up every single day. And so I've played for coaches where every single individual period was the exact same every single day. And I understand the importance of routine and, but some of the monotony that comes with that and uh, playing for coach Dungy for the Colts, he talked about like being on a, a winning successful team is boring. It should be boring because you're used to holding yourself at such a high level. And when I've been to other places where you you're like you the sentiment in the locker room was well i hope we win this week it, it it's very unnerving and different to see that you you don't think that you're going to win i don't care who we're playing but like just to have that mindset that oh well we might not like that's the type of environment that you're trying to 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 erase and, and rewrite and 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 get players competing for themselves really but ultimately see how they're how, how bettering them themselves helps the overall team culture. And sometimes I feel like coaches emphasize the team above the individual, but in today's world, I'm just, if, if you make, if you, if you help the player understand how his role is important to the team and how making him a better player ultimately makes a team better, but makes his own goals more likely to happen. Mm -hmm. and, and and I see this a lot in college recruiting, and it's really strange to me that in today's world of college of the NIL and the transfer portal, that college coaches have to court their players year after year after year, which is different from when I played in college. But a lot of these colleges are like, hey, look at all these different uniform combinations I can wear. Look at all of the things that are outside of football. And maybe there are some kids that it, that's important to them. but how do I, how do I connect with that player? Where do you want to go with this game? Maybe you, you, they don't know yet. As a high school player, you ask me that. I'm like, well, I'm just here to play football until it's baseball season, you know? And so at that time, cool. Don't, don't discourage what a, a player's goals are at that time. Cause the goals are going to change. Their path is likely going to change, but it takes one bad interaction from a coach to, to, to take that kid away from football. And mm. that's, that's one of my big messages when I work with like the youth coaches, it's like, look, I know you guys want to win. I know you want those plastic rings and trophies, but I promise you in five, 10 years, most of your players will not remember your name. And that should be okay with you. If you're out here because you want your players to remember your name, you're not out here for the right reason. Mm -hmm. And so if, if we can help our players understand like, yeah, for most kids, they're not going to go play in the NFL, but that doesn't mean you stomp out and, and smush their dream. You know, like there, there's ways to get them to be motivated in practice, regardless of their talent level, because there are some kids who high school is as far as it's going to go for them. And if they can come to practice, they might have, you know, dreams of playing beyond that, you know, are likely statistically probably not going to be in that kid's favor, but who are you to take that dream away from them? Right. Cause you stop that dream out now, all they're going to do is, you know, go through the motions, but if you, you don't, but you also don't have to sell them fake pipe dreams. You can be realistic with them, but figuring out how that individual and, and it's, and it's, and it's easier to do at the high school level than above because of how the business becomes more involved, the higher up you go. And there's less and less, personal relationships in the game as a coach but to me like the more the more like I, when people ask me i mean i have great things to say about every single coach i've played for i mean there's definitely things that i would do differently um but coach dungy tony dungy with the colts who was my first coach in the nfl was so different in terms of the demeanor it was almost like if you failed whether it was an offsides, a holding call, false start, whatever, he was like disappointed in you, like a parent was disappointed in you. And it hurt more 
than a coach screaming at you. And so when I'm working with coaches, whether the high school or the youth levels, it's like, look, if you're screaming at a, co- a player, if you're screaming, you're elevating your voice because you're frustrated at him. Maybe it's not the player. Maybe it's something that you as a coach can do a better job describing. So mm-hmm. for me, it's not my job to go, okay, this, do it this way. You know, like I got short arms. There are certain things that work better for me than a guy who has really long arms and can make first contact more often than not. So for me, I need to learn how to expand how I describe what I want to happen, you know, whether that's an objective, whether that's a technique, because I can say one thing to two different players and they're going to hear two different messages. They're going to give me two different results. If I'm saying that, if I'm just yelling at the kid who's not giving me the desired result and I'm just mad and frustrated, Maybe he deserves it, but most often than not, it's just you shoving that square peg into a round hole and you're not going to get anywhere. And all you're going to do there, there's very, very rarely is it going to end positive. Um, So giving players multiple ways to understand a concept because there's some, I mean, uh, when I played with Andrew Whitworth in uh, Cincinnati, I didn't see the guy take down a single note. He could sit there, listen to coach Alexander, talk about what he wanted to occur and he had it memorized, you know, just an insanely smart player. I was a guy that I, I mean, I, I was writing down every single note just so I, I had that to go back to. Um, so players are going to be different. It's getting to know your players, getting to know what, why they play football. Like, I think that's an important conversation to have. And that's uh, something I always asked in fall camp when I was coaching high school. I, I went around, I said, why do you play this game? And you may not know. I mean, I I, I played because it, I wanted to, you know, the people that were trying to push me to play football. I was like, okay, look, I'm playing football. I didn't. I my first week of freshman practice, I wanted to quit every single day. I hated it. I'm glad I didn't. Um, but every person's why is going to change. And when I got to the NFL, it changed. When I had kids, it changed. Um, when I was in college, they told me I was undersized. If I went, if I stayed home to ASU, I wasn't going to make it to the NFL. Like you, your why changes. And, and I think it's great to have negative negativity in your life. I think it's great to have the naysayers, um, the people who don't think you will achieve anything only if it's only if you're able to channel that properly. Cause there's a lot of people that go in a dark place when they're told they're not good enough. But as a coach's perspective in football, like there's ways to get your players to elevate their own game. But I think it starts with better understanding that individual and understanding what makes them tick. Why are they out there to football? And the old adage, well, we got to build toughness. Like toughness is really a prerequisite to play football. Like in Arizona in July, August, when they start playing, it's 115 degrees outside. I mean, there's no humidity. I mean, I, I will I will take 115 degrees over the 90 degree, 90 percent humidity of the Carolinas any single day. Um, but it, it's how do you connect with that player and and getting him to see the value in elevating his own craft and and in the bigger picture of how that helps the team. Yeah, and I, when I was doing my research and looking you up, I pulled up this picture and. I, I know you don't know this, but this guy that you're getting ready to block here, his name is John Graves, and he he played for me at Meadowbrook High School. He was a team captain at Virginia Tech, and I, I'm the guy who told him, yeah, sign a free agent deal with the Texans, and he played the same position as J.J. Watt, okay? It was the same year J.J. Watt went into the league, but he, he you know, I know this is a uh, preseason game because he never actually played, I think, in a in a uh, regular season game, but uh, he went on to be a strength coach at Washington State, Wisconsin, most recently Mississippi State. But John Graves, man, ain't that crazy that I, I awesome. pulled up a picture of you and then I see one of my former players here, you know, and John was the best, man. He's, you know, he's everything you're talking about, you know, um, what's right about football. And Jim Tim has got another question. Jim, I think you've reached your limit after this one. Um, <laughs> who was the most challenging for you on teams you played w- with, and who was the most challenging for you to block during your career? And I'm going to add something to Jim's question. 
if you would have known about the tip of the spear techniques, would that have helped you against these guys? So who were the best that you had to practice against and who were the best that you got to play against? And would you do anything differently now that you know the tip of the spear? Um, well, absolutely. I think just having an understanding of cr creating postures of strength absolutely would it would have helped me. Um, I mean, I was I played four years for the Colts blocking for Peyton Manning, and I thought I understood how an offense works. And then I when I went to Carolina, um, it was Cam Newton's second year, and a lot of the pass protection um, changes like we had to be more aware of the secondary where were the safeties when they rotate down we got to change our, our slide change our point um, so I had to learn a whole whole another realm that I thought I had known but you know um, from a player's perspective man it's um, I, I played against I mean Albert Hainsworth was was a beast when he was playing for the Titans and yeah. just, I mean, they would get into some crazy fronts where he, he would normally play three technique. He'd be bumped out as like a five technique. And then their defensive end, uh, Kyle Vandenbosch would be out in like a 11 technique and they would run these twist games where you get a big guy like that. Um, Haloti Nada, um, who was with the Ravens for a while, just, uh, my rookie year, he was in a three technique and Rex Ryan was a defensive coordinator and he would back off the ball and in like a, a sprinter stance, three yards off the ball. And so Haloti Nada was this giant man oh, yeah. um, to, to get a big head start. Um, um, had I, And in my career played against like guys like Cam Hayward, um, J.J. Watt were really good. Um, yeah. a, guy, a guy, a teammate in Cincinnati, Geno Atkins, was, yeah. a, was, a, was Thomas. a guy who – Yes. St. Thomas was Aquinas. A, was a guy who – is an undersized guy, but just had built natural yeah. leverage. You know, he could squat a house. Yeah, 600 and, pounds, I think. And, 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 and we talk about having our toes turned out slightly. Well, I think he was just born that way, and guys would kind of like make fun of him for it. But I remember playing against him as a Colt and just getting bull rushed. I'm like, who is this guy getting underneath my pads? Like, I've never been bull rushed before. And then getting to be a teammate and kind of see his work ethic and, and see what makes him great. Um, uh, Vince Wolfork, Casey Hampton, like played against some really, really amazing guys. And uh, it, it's hard to say who is the best because even well, when, when look when at the, the Hall the ones, of Fame. Yeah. I mean, Vince Wolfork, JJ Watt. I mean, ha Hainsworth was probably the most talented of them all. Yeah. And well, I think one of my, the, the most impressed I've ever been on the field, honestly, was. Um, so my, my one year in Carolina was Luke Keekley's rookie year, middle linebacker yeah, rookie year. Team. And, and just, just being blown away from seeing a rookie go sideline to sideline as quick as he did. But I got to play against him when I was a, a Carolina, uh, as a Cincinnati Bengal and just hearing him call out what the plays were before mm -hmm. the ball was snapped was and and there's videos and, and this has been talked about. Yeah enough but i mean what an i mean i think he's one of the most pure great athletes from a defensive how big aspect. is he um he's he's not the biggest guy there's definitely guys like think, six you know, one six yeah two? i i honestly don't know his stats off the top of my bat but yeah he's no bigger than six two i would guess like but, six two two forty yeah yeah but just uh a passion for the game knowledge of the game that is really second to none I mean, he, he's been compared to like guys like Brian Erlacher, who, who I, I mean, I, I played against Erlacher and Ray Lewis at the early of my career, at the late, the tail end of their career. So I saw different versions of them. Um, I remember Ray Lewis, my rookie year, um, I was pulling on a, a short little single back power play and he's pointing at me going, Pollock's pulling, Pollock's pulling. And in my mind, I'm going, wow, that's pretty cool. Ray Lewis is, knows my name, but then I'm, Go, quickly brought back to reality going how in the world does he know i'm pulling and it took me like i i, I can't tell you how long like hours studying the game film after the game going where's the difference where's the difference and it was like the smallest of tilts of my spine angle that was different it was the only thing i could i could figure that he was king off of but playing with uh, playing with and against luke keekley i mean w was an amazing experience i mean and i, I can go on for days 235 jim yeah uh, 
So Sorry, I was Luke, Jim I, Tim says 6'3", 235. Yeah. I was pretty close, Jim Tim. Yeah, I don't want to – yeah, 6'3". Not, not, I want to give you that That's extra inch. 6'2", 240. So yeah, I mean, yeah. Hey, no, he, he, he was a great player. Um, I mean, and then getting the some of the guys I played with on the Colts, Dwight Freeney watching that guy, there'd be third downs – where yeah. our coach Howard Mudd would be trying to go through the the old papers, trying to talk about the play, and Jeff Saturday would be like, "Hey, hold on, it's third down. Let's go watch Dwight Freeney do a spin remove and oh, go wow. kill this quarterback." He, he so basically it, said, "Like, okay, look, we gotta watch this. We gotta watch this." Yeah, we got to be now. we got to be like fans on the side on the sideline watching some of these great guys go off and and make plays. Yeah, I, I had Clyde Christensen on the show. Um, that was a surprise, man, to have a guy like him, you know, and coach what, what a great, what a great man. I, I what a great that. man. Talk, talk about some, uh, talk about him. And t- I mean, that staff that they had was crazy with Tom Moore and Clyde Christensen and, uh, you know, Howard Mudd. Yeah. I mean, golly. Yeah. It, it, it's a little hard to really appreciate it when you're in it in the day to day, you're like, all right, we got meetings, we got practice, we got walkthroughs and it's just like repeat, rinse, recycle. Um, but when you get to step away and really, truly appreciate the, the, the knowledge, the experience that w- was in that building on that team for so long. Um, I mean, you, every coach has their own script of practice, but Peyton, Peyton Manning would, would have his own script. So we'd get done with our plays and then, you know, he wore those high, like 1980s style socks still, um, he would pull out his own um script he's like all right i got 10 more plays to run and all the veterans are rolling their eyes going i just want to go home go see my kids and you're out here running what if scenarios but i mean what an amazing organization to group of men to to learn from and to enter the nfl and to learn how to really be a pro it it was very grateful for that opportunity so I know we don't have enough time for you to go over all the particulars of what y'all teach, but for the rec coach, the youth coach, the high school coach that may be watching, uh, give them just a little synops- a synopsis about what tip of the spear is about. And then we'll get into like, what, what's the first steps they should take. But sure. first, like tell, tell us a little bit, you know, give us the five minute rundown on what exactly y'all teach. Yeah, so ideally our program is based on elevating everybody's knowledge for contact and whether it's contact on the line of scrimmage, out in space, um, our our kind of level one program is our principles of contact that really talks about one-on-one situations. Um, And so whether that's a lineman, whether that's a skill position player, when two humans are engaged in contact, there are some principles that are very important. And we all talk about playing with a strong base Um, But I can think back to coaches who gave me coaching points of having my feet shoulder width apart. And so one of the things that we do is we want to play with a triangular base. So our feet a little bit wider than our shoulders, and we want to have our toes turned out slightly. Now, when I run a sprint, and and most players are used to running in linear fashions through their speed and conditioning programs, or they're doing agility drills where they're running in linear fashion, where your toes are straight ahead and your foot is either going heel, ball, toe to, to take off, or a lot of sprinting mechanics, you're staying on the balls and toes of your feet. Whereas for contact, we use a term being rooted or grounded through through three points of contact in our feet. So our, our heel, our, our the ball of our foot, the instep, and the big toe. Like we should feel like those three points are secure in the ground for contact. That allows us to tap into what is our 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 uh, source of power, our hips. We spend a lot of time pushing. And I know Scott mentioned that like the bench press is the, mo- the most repped uh, upper body mechanic that high school players do. But on the football field, a push is different than using your hips for contact. When I push something, my head is getting closer. My hips are usually sent the opposite direction. Well, if I use my hips as the driver for force, that's why I can squat more than I can bench press. My head, just based off the mechanic process of our kinetic chain, my head is pulled away from contact. So I can add more power for my objective of contact. I'm eliminating my helmet. I was always taught three points of contact, my face mask and my hands that made a triangle there. Well, we're using our hips to create force deflection. I know Scott talked about that on your on your last episode with him. Um, 
But to do that, we need to create a conduit between our opponent and that power of uh, force from our hips. So how we posture our, our arms by getting our elbows, a lot of coaches use a coaching point, tight hands, tight hands. We we take it a, a, a step back and go, we want tight elbows. We want the elbows inside the frame of the body. So when I uncoil my hips, my all of that energy can be transferred into my elbows, through my forearms and into my hands. If I have tight hands and my elbows are flared wide, even if I have thumbs up, which was my coaching points for, for many years, thumbs up, it, it has a tendency of flaring my elbows wide, which disconnects mm -hmm. from my source of power. So by rotating my thumbs out 45 degrees, if I'm in a blocking capacity or long arms in our pillar with the thumbs out, it allows that maximum transference of, of, of force. And now I went to Arizona State. I, I understand it's not an Ivy League school, but these simple basic physics concepts are very simple to understand. And it, it, I mean, we don't have to have a very high level of intelligence to understand the, these very simple uh, mechanisms of the body. And I'm not going to sell that I'm smarter than I am or have all of these letters down at the end of my name, but these concepts are, they work, they're very effective. And so the best piece of advice is start with creating a strong base, learning how to play with our hips, whether it's under ourselves to sustain contact, how to use our hips to create contact and then how to execute um, our objective with our hands. Sometimes I know Scott talked about having our shoulder involved. If contact is occurring beyond five yards, that level of force is too great for our hands. So we want to maximize that level of impact through our shoulder. Um, and then one of the things that we teach that I have never learned as a player or what we call leverage recovery tools. So our refit, our brace hop, how to respond to those moments where my plan didn't go according how I wanted it to, you know, like I, I'm in a stalemate or I missed with my hand or the opponent took an upper hand in, and he has now better position in my chest. How do I regain my, my leverage and control over the situation? So it's not only this is a better way to do it, but there's also a troubleshoot component in there that we want players to understand how to get out of situations where their body posture starts to get in a suboptimal um, position and they don't panic. I know a lot of coaches were just yelling, drive your feet, drive your feet. And I'm sitting there stuck in a stalemate, chopping my feet in my place. I'm not moving anywhere. So again, I think coaches, if we expect more from our players as coaches, we should also expect to elevate our own knowledge for contact, for the techniques that we're teaching, how it coincides with the scheme of our team, and how we can implement that skill development in a year-round setting. So coaches will come to us for various different reasons. It's, hey, I heard about you, or I saw this one drill, what else do you do? Or we'll go do a clinic for a program, and they're like, well, I, I like this drill and this drill. I'm not sure about this yet. And then the next year, they're like, man, this helped us so much. I, I, can you teach me that other thing I didn't really pay attention to? And so we, we, we have a number of programs that we've been working with for five, six, seven years now that every time we go back, we're adding a new layer. Um, we're trying to meet the needs that they, that they feel is important to their program rather than just going across the country, taking a rubber stamp and go, this is how you play football. This is how you play football because coaches should have that autonomy to go, you know what? I would be a fool to go into any high school youth NFL room and be like, well, I know better than you because I played here. You, every coach has their own experience. They have things that they've done that are successful that have been successful. Um, but there are all, always ways that we can continue to evolve. So there's things, there's drills, there are protocols that coaches will never deviate from because they've had success. That's fantastic. How else can we optimize other areas of what you're doing? And so we have online resources, we have in-person training, and now we've got uh, a, a building equipment line as well. So if I'm a rec coach or high school coach and I'm interested in learning more, I need to go to your website, get the, 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 uh, the free 30 days, and then what should I do? What, what videos should I start with looking at first? Yeah. So, I mean, if you're an offensive or defensive line coach, 
take advantage of that, the, the tip of the spear library where it has all of our content. Um, there are more and more youth. And well, most youth coaches are required to take some sort of coaching certification. Um, so we have a contact certification course that, that, that checks the box that the other generic ones that they they're used to taking, but every year more and more people come to us to take ours. And there's a lot of youth leagues that we do their certification process for because it's checking that box in regards to risk and liability, but they're, it's, they're also receiving information that they value or they view as higher than what they were previously getting. Now, we, we don't want to ever lower the bar in terms of coaching. And so we never really sought out to create a certification because at the end of the day, we've all sat in front of a computer, clicked some boxes, and what do we take yeah. away from it? Um, but it, it seems to be very it's, – it's been well-received. Um, and so our, our biggest client is, uh, the New Jersey suburban youth football league in, in kind of central New Jersey. They've got like 25 programs that we go out there every August. They take our online certification course. We go and do uh, clinics for their coaches and then we do camps for all of their players. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think if you're just wanting to get a toe in the pool, we have a contact drills library. That's our core curriculum. Um, but again, we, we're, we're trying to put in pathways, whether a coach wants an all a card, I want to go in there and learn uh, some counters for pass protection strikes for pass protection. How do I defeat a double team? Um, what are some tackling drills I can do? Um, then there's some coaches who want to be led step one, step two, step three. So we have pathways for everybody and we are creating new co clinics all the time. I've done I've, I've been to high schools where they're like, we want to install zone and having played in Indy, it's more than just inside outside zone. And so we can do a clinic where we, where we teach the tight inside, mid wide outside zone, we get the whole spectrum. And then it's like, okay, well, how do we implement it with the players that you have, the formations, the motions that you like to do, the passing concepts that will best gel with it. Um, and to really create a semi-customized program because again i don't it'd be boring for me if i went around and just gave you gave every program the same speech every single time like i enjoy the challenge of hey here's the plays that we like here are the defenses that we normally use we've we haven't had success with these two plays why do you have any recommendations of how to uh, how to optimize and improve it I mean, those are some of my favorite ones to do because I get back in that game planning mode. Um, there's a number of programs in Austin, Texas area that have had uh, playoff runs, multiple state championships um, here in Arizona, the school district. Um, there's a lot of school districts that will hire us to kind of check that safety box for their programs. But when I go to the schools, I'm working individually with each one of them to, to provide whatever they need that that season. You know, like sometimes you lose all five starting linemen. Hey, we need to start back at square run with, with some foundational drills. Hey, we've got a really good chance that the team that won the highest state championship here last year got to work hands on and be a little bit more nuanced with the instruction we were able to give them. So your product line back behind you, you got all kinds of stuff. Can, can you go over some of, of your product line that you have? I know you got the bag. I know you all got the cuffs. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So first, like our, our Lev cuffs, um, some of the coaches out there probably have some fuzzy ones in their nightstand next to their bedroom. And that's their bed. Coach McNally uh, definitely does. We're, we're going to leave it there. Uh, we we can get – yeah, yeah. I mean, but handcuffs on. That's what we yeah, learned. Yeah, handcuffs absolutely. On. So, but it's so not we, just the hands; it's it's the it's, elbows. It's the elbows. And so, the bedroom ones for your handcuffs. You do you do you. The lev cuff is for the elbows. It's to train the the posture of the elbows. So Scott always calls them like training wheels for this program. So when you're trying to teach hip driven power, that can be that can be a challenging venture for many kids who are used to just pushing, 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 and. I grew up on sleds that just moved in a horizontal fashion. So I was pushing and driving, taking big, long steps, and then getting thrown to the ground and then being yelled at that I was on the ground. Well, what, 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 was that, what was the end result going to be if you're teaching me this way? The elbows help 
isolate that aspect where I can work on, I can keep the hands in a, in the proper position inside the frame of the body. So I can drill, drill, drill all of the hip driven um, exercises that need to be. And then I can take the cuffs off once I'm starting to develop that posture. Um, the blast shield, we just, we just released this year with uh, Ray Crowther who, I mean, the, the Ray Crowther pan sled I've used at every level of football. And so we have developed a really great relationship with those, with, with that organization. Um, but the blast shield, I mean, I've got a, a cardboard cutout under my desk that was originally my, my, our plan because I would go to all of these different schools and programs and see hand shields, different shapes and sizes. But the common theme was that they were wider than the opponents that the players would face, you know, like we're, and it's preaching. right behind you, right? Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, it's this one right here. So it's got these contours where I can get my hands into a, a, a smaller width that more replicates what shoulder pads feel like mm -hmm. in your hands. And so we were seeing uh, pads that were really wide and hearing coaches talk about playing with tight hands, tight elbows, but the equipment, the tools on the field that they would use on, on in, in their development – didn't match what was the instruction. So we got frustrated and we were using smaller like MMA pads because it had a lot of the videos you'll see like these Muay Thai kick pads uh, fastened to poles that were striking because we wanted a more narrow striking surface where we could rotate our thumbs out, hit the, the spot on our palm that we deem as the tip of the spear. Um, but we just didn't have that in, in, in the marketplace. And so we so partnered with- So this is the tip of the spear. Yeah. Right yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you think about like a, a spear when it's a spear is being thrown like we Scott didn't just go, hey, this is a, a cool logo and a cool name. I mean, obviously, it's a, a term used in the military. Um, but for us, that visual of like engaging an opponent with a spear, that tip is the first thing that's going to strike. When we hit with our hands, we don't want to hit with all of our hands. I mean, I play with guys got jacked up fingers. I've got a jacked up finger. Um so in our hand, there's a bone opposite of our thumb called the lunate bone. And when I rotate my thumb out 45 degrees, that bone is in direct alignment with the lunate bone, or excuse me, the ulna in the forearm and then the humerus in the upper arm. So I'm stacking bones on, on top of bones, creating a structural uh, strength. Um, and that contact is going to init be initiated first through that tip of the spear, that lunate bone. And so if I have thumbs up and I have that pillar fit, the direction of that elbow joint is different. So those bones are not aligned. So now when force, when oncoming force is applied, I have a natural bend in my elbow. When I get to that rotation of 45 degrees with the thumb and put all of that force through that lunate bone, that's when you're, you're using your skeletal system to be the conduit, you know, that spear. And, and so, yes, the, that point of our hand and pass protection, we're not striking with our whole hand or palm. We call, it's like putting a, a pillow at the end of our spear. We want to be very forceful and direct and, and focus all of that energy that we're creating into smaller spots. Because on defense, that's how I really shock and separate from that blocker. And on offense, that's how I really change the spine angle and elevate through force deflection and, and stick on a block. Yeah. Um... So, I mean, we've already been on here over an hour, man, and we've just been going straight through. Uh, what else would you like the coaches that are watching? If we have any questions, y'all, you need to ask. Put it in the um, the chat. But for the coaches that are watching or will watch, what else would you like them to know about Tip of the Spear well, that we haven't covered yet? Yeah, well, I, I think – one of the biggest things that I came on tip of the spear or why I chose to go the tip of the spear route is I felt football was kind of at a juncture point in history where if left to the same narrative, I mean, the attrition rates and youth football were on the decline for over a, well over a decade. Um, high school participation. I know when I graduated from high school, there were like 99 kids on our varsity team. When I went mm -hmm. back to coach, there were 47. So I was seeing it. I was, I was reading the headlines and I was seeing it in person that football was kind of like bleeding out in a, in a sense. But having seen the business side of the higher levels, it, it was not going to be the, the NFL to save football. It was not going to be the NCA to save football. It's not going to be the NFHS. No, no, no negative 
thing, like their priorities are just different and it's, and it can be hard to see the bigger picture. And so from my, my point of view, I, I see, and currently there's a bill in California that's trying to be pushed through to ban tackle football again until the age of the 13. And I didn't play youth football, so I cannot say you have to play youth football in order to play in the NFL. There are plenty of examples. That's a silly argument. To me, the future of the game, it, it really relies on youth football. And so like the lowest levels of the game, I'm not saying you have to put your kid in, in tackle football, but let's let's examine what happens if you eliminate that as an option. Well, youth sports that I'm learning now as a father is a wild beast. Everybody is vying for your dollar. Everyone is vying for your time. And every sport in, in really the, I mean, I'm the West Coast, we get pretty good weather. So you get a lot of year round sports, year round baseball. Football is becoming a year round um, a sport at the youth level. Um, but really like, have taking that choice away from parents. If you if you say no, your son, your child cannot play football at a, a young level. Well, what are they going to do? They're likely they, most kids play different sports, so they're likely going to go. Okay, I'm going to go play basketball. I'm going to go play baseball, lacrosse, whatever, what have you. Then they're going to get super focused on their year round sport, mm -hmm. and then by the time they get to the level where they're allowed to play football again. Well, in Arizona, California, there, there's not many places that you can do middle school football. It's not like Texas where you come out of the the hospital with a football helmet on after you were born. It's different. So the, most of these kids, if you eliminate youth football, will not get to play football until they're in high school. By the time they get to the high school level, are they really are are the majority of them really going to go? Okay, now I get to play football. I mean, yeah, you can still play flag football, but the majority of the people on the field at a time are, are linemen and most linemen aren't going to be keeping up with these premier flag football leagues, these seven on seven leagues, they're going to go find other sports. And so by the time they get to high school, most of them, I, 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 I would debate this with anybody. Most of them will not choose football because they will have spent. Yeah. Too much time good, in another, too sport. much time in another sport that they're going to go, you know what? I'm going to continue this, this journey. Well, then they become grownups. They have kids of their own. They've been they spent their entire life not watching football, not being connected to football. It's it. This isn't a oh you cancel football, football is going to die. This is a snowball that can have a drastic effect on the game. So in our perspective, instead of going, you know what, let's ban something because that's what they're trying to do. They go oh, football creates con uh, concussions concussions are bad therefore let's reduce the opportunities for football we are our approach is let's give better information how we can have less hits to the head i know scott talked about how the browns have had the fewest impacts to the helmet on their offensive line over the past two years within an internal study that the nfl did so the techniques not only are are dominant they've been top five rushing their physical punishing offensive line, but they're mm -hmm. also using their helmet at a lower rate, the lowest rate in the NFL. So there is some efficacy there. So if we can, at the youth level, understand our importance, you, now it's not the, the end of the world if a kid doesn't want to play youth football, but there are millions of kids, families who want their child to, to do something, an activity that they enjoy. So we need to do our due diligence to evolve that beyond the, oh, here's your yearly certification um yeah we take this program at the end of the day if coaches don't believe in that thing then they're not going to elicit change and we're not going to have a better evolved game for the future so in my mind our company is one of a handful out there that are actively trying to be proactive in this situation in the situation and go here's information that didn't exist previously here's information that we know scales at every single level now, we're not trying to make you NFL players, but we want coaches to elevate their knowledge. So the parents that are handing over their child for a practice for a game, they're confident in knowing, hey, my child's coach is educated in this sport better than the town next to me, you know, mm -hmm. or my other option. And that's really why a lot of uh, youth programs are seeking us out is they're having internal co competition. They're, they're, they're fighting for registration. And while most youth football registration is dying, the programs that have been using tip of the spear 
have seen their registration continue to grow and the injury rates have, have skyrocketed the opposite direction. Meaning, I mean, there's a program up in Scottsdale that t tells us that they've in the three, four years that they've worked with us, they've had more championships than concussions. And so mm -hmm. there, there is a, a growing, um, cheering party out there for us just celebrating this information and i mean scott you've talked to him like it, it's not about me it's not about scott it's about the game of football and th the game of football will be here long gone hopefully will be here long for many years after we are gone and hopefully this is a stamp on the game that we can help right some of the wrongs that or the the apathy that's happened in, in years past so our goal is when a when a coach a family a youth organization high school and above they get connected with the tip of the spear they are essentially saying that we want football to remain physical we want it to remain our country's primary entertainment source right that the, the football is it's what it's the reason why the, the super bowl is the, the the most watched event in the the year mm -hmm. is because people people love football but if you continue to strip away what football is and you, we watched this past NFL season, it seems like if you got too close and sneezed on the quarterback, they threw a flag. Um, oh, yeah. There's, there's initiatives to put flag football in the Olympics. I don't think that helps the game of football. I, 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 I my son plays flag football and he wants to play tackle football, but the reason I'm keeping him in flag football is not because of a safety issue. It's because I know he's built like me. Once he makes the jump to, tackle football he's putting his hand on the ground and there's a yeah. time and a place for that but right now he's catching touchdowns with his buddies and i want him to enjoy that process flag football has a, a spot in the pathway of the game but if we make that the end game flag yeah. football then it takes away from the, the sport that the majority of society enjoys and so we're trying to provide information and resources so every coach feels confident in the instruction that they're giving they feel like it's the most uh it's the highest level of information they could be giving their player um and whatever challenges th they can i mean I, I spend a good chunk of my week fielding emails just answering people's questions about practice implementation off-season development in-season game planning all, all of it because it again it's not about me it's about the game of football and and tip of the spear is kind of helping lead that proactive movement. So, how can people get a hold of you? We got your Twitter down there. We got y'all's website. Anything else you'd like to say? How can people um, get up with you, Mike? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, uh, our Twitter. I mean, I'm not the best on Twitter. My personal account is Mike underscore Pollock. Our Twitter uh, for tip of the spear, I think, is tip of the spear FB. FB. Mm -hmm. um we put our social media team we do a lot of drills and and things to show tidbits of what's out there but really like w we offer a free 30-day trial because it's like look we don't we're not selling snake oil like you have the opportunity if you want to watch 30 days free of video and and cancel no sweat off my back but we have a very high conversion rate because once people take a look at the videos they go wow these are are, are higher level information videos than we're used to. It's not just Ooh, like yeah. a single camera um, talking into the wind. And um, we, we try to put some, pr some production behind it to help with the retention, because at the end of the day, if you're not retaining the information, you're not going to use it. You might hear a good speech, but if you don't know how to put it into practice, it's just useless information. Um, so yeah, our website, tsfb.com, tip of the spear um, sign up for a, a video, check it out for a while. There's a contact us form that if you have any questions about some of our in-person clinics, um, we used to do a lot more public O-line D-line camps. Um, but now Scott's in the NFL, our bandwidth has really been with individual programs that bring us out. So like I said, coming, starting this weekend, I mean, I've already been to a few places, but the next few weekends are pretty busy on my schedule. Um, so I'll be kind of all over the country, but I mean, the, in, the questions through our website gets filtered back to me and I'll get them to my, our, our team. We've got instructors in various markets that help us run those in-person um, events. Um, but really our, our website's our number one 
number one way to get a hold of us, see the information that we provide. And, and if there's a question that you ever have of how we can help, don't don't feel like you can't reach out because we'll get back to you. Um, and if there's a delay in us getting back to you, just know that we're on the road and trying to help other people get better at this game. Well, we appreciate you coming on. Thank you to our sponsors, Rat Coach, the Top Hopper. Use the uh, code Top Hop, save five percent. Uh, Tip of the Spear now is an official sponsor of the Championship Football Coaches Clinic podcast. And Mike, make sure you send a message to Sports Workbook on Twitter, and they're going to send you uh, a free Sports Workbook for coming on today. And they'll customize it with your name and tip of the spear and everything. So, and, and get them to send send one for Scott Peters too. I love that. Okay, absolutely. I appreciate what you're doing and getting great great people to, to to talk and spread the word and just get some more information. And so we we love being a sponsor of what you're doing. Yeah, appreciate you. Thank you, Mike. Take care.